the next logical question becomes, well, what are some good sleep hygiene habits that you would recommend that people can implement into their life such that they can restore their body's ability to get restorative sleep for optimal health? Yeah, that's, um, and I would just add, you know, one of the solutions to the system problem is a wise voice like Mastering Diabetes and, and yours, Cyrus and, you, and Robbie, where you guys step in and help people break that cycle in the trifecta and say, okay, we're going to, we're going to get out of the cycle and we're going to step into a solution based coaching program. And so that's why I think that's the first step of getting out of this cycle. Um, because you need a wise voice, you need a coach or you need a guide to help you understand how to rebuild a system that's broken, especially when you've never been taught how to understand the system. And so um, that's why I, I honor everything that you're doing. Yeah, so sleep hygiene is, you know, uh, if we think back a thousand years, we can really understand sleep hygiene. And it's not complex, but actually the implementation, like, like eating a whole food plant-based diet can be challenging in our West, Western culture. So what's really interesting, if we just go back one step and understand that, you know, it's the light dark cycle that's really important for maintaining sleep hygiene, we begin to understand how to how to reset uh, our sleep architecture, our sleep environment and our sleep habits. Um, you know, when people uh, are shifting their sleep at night and they're allowing screens to inter intervene in their bedtime and intrude upon their sleep um, when we're staying up late. Uh, our body produces like 38% less melatonin, which is really significant. It's almost half. And so you, you really begin disrupting yourself when you're going to bed late. So, you know, first, um, uh, aspect of sleep hygiene is seven to eight hours of sleep at night. That's ideal. We really want to work towards bedtime 10 to 11, get up at six o'clock and get rolling. And what's, you know, an important thing to tell ourselves, uh, is to kind of break some lies. And one lie that I used to have is that, you know, I can cheat my sleep a little bit, uh, and get more work done and I'll just get up in the morning and I'll be more efficient tomorrow. But the lie is really that, um, you're going to be more efficient and get more work done. What really happens is that you, you know, cheat your sleep, you stay up late. And you get more work done, but you wake up in the morning and the research shows that you're less efficient the next day. So that's a really important lie that is a, uh, we need to remove from our thinking about efficiency and work, that staying up late, getting work done is actually going to improve our efficiency during the week. In reality, it detracts from it. And so part of sleep hygiene is breaking some lies that we may be believe about sleep. The second most important thing is to turn off screens. You know, that is number two, uh, because they intrude on our sleep. And, you know, watching television at night, going to sleep with the television on, uh, social media, especially news today, um, you know, any of that screen time, that, that light interacts with our SCN in our brain, and it adjusts that sleep-wake cycle, reduces melatonin production, and we don't enter into that deep sleep, that restorative, regenerative part of sleep. So we really need to turn screens off an hour before we go to bed. And now this is easier said than done, you know, especially with these little phones that we like to keep at our bedside. I have a hard time doing that too, but it's, you know, turn off the TV, turn off the computers, stop working, don't scroll on your, on your phone, pick up a book, have a conversation, listen to some music. And I'll tell you what, it's like any habit, you know, it can be challenging. Start small and work toward that change. But if you can overcome that screen time at nighttime, you will see a profound impact on your sleep. And I promise you, you will wake in the morning feeling rested, regenerated and ready to go. And in a month's time, um, for people living with diabetes, your insulin resistance or insulin requirements will come down, I promise you. So that's number two, get rid of the screens before, at least an hour before bedtime. You know, a third one, which is really important, and I think I was uh, talking to Robbie about, you know, the importance of intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding. Eating earlier is really advantageous. Finishing dinner by five um, has a significant impact on the um, the benefits of your deep sleep. And so your body has processed a lot of food by the time you go to bed. It's not working hard to break food down and you're not producing stomach acid and you will sleep better if you eat earlier in the day. 
And the more that you can compress your food, you know, to an eight or 10 hour window in the daytime, the better um, you will, uh, you know, the better off your sleep and, and your inflammatory levels and insulin management. Um, next one is caffeine. If you're going to drink caffeine before noon, um, you have to stop at noontime. Don't drink caffeine after lunch. You know, there are people that are rapid metabolizers of caffeine that can drink caffeine and it, it, most of it's broken down and it doesn't impact their sleep. But caffeine still impacts the adenosine receptors, which do have a, an influence over deep sleep. So you really do want to, to stop all caffeine after lunch. That's really, really important. Um, the next one is activity. You know, it's, it's important to be active. Um, activity is really, really, uh, uh, you know, beneficial for a good night's sleep. So if you can get up and be active during the day or afternoon, make sure you do that. That's uh, the research shows that that contributes to a good sleep architecture. It's interesting too with uh, with um, sleep deprivation. They found that uh, sleep deprivation is the same risk factor for um, as inactivity for insulin resistance. So in other words, inactivity and sleep deprivation have the same level of risk on insulin resistance. So that, you know, if we optimize those two, it really does improve insulin resistance uh, as well. That's fascinating. Keep going, keep going. Um, so then, you know, we also want to, um, you know, uh, use our bed only for sleep at night. So some people work on their bed, they sit on their bed and work with computers. And it, we're actually training our brains to, uh, you know, think about an environment as a work setting. And, and so if you're using your bedroom as a workplace or you're sitting on your bed to work, your brain will actually be activated when you sit down on your bed. So use your bed for sleep, but not work. Um, use your bed to go to sleep and not even watch TV. If you're going to watch a movie uh, or watch some television, watch it in the other room at least an hour before bedtime. And then when you go into your bedroom, the purpose of your bedroom is to sleep. So quiet, beautiful, ambient light, uh, quiet music, and everything about your bedroom is about getting a good night's sleep. That's really important. You know, some people like to use essential oils like um, like lavender. They can be beneficial in assisting a good night's sleep. Uh, people that are traveling, uh, melatonin can be beneficial in rebooting that uh, circadian rhythm. And so adding a little mel melatonin if you've had sleep disruption can help regulate uh, normal sleep architecture. And the last thing that I'll add is, um, you know, we oftentimes have lots of thing on, things on our mind before we go to bed. And so, you know, it's uh, helpful to take a few minutes to write things down on a piece of paper and set them aside on your desk, not next to your bed. And even just tell yourself, I've written everything down. I'll pick it up in the morning and I'll deal with it tomorrow. You know, the act of writing something down on a piece of paper and then telling yourself that it's there and you'll deal with it in the morning gives your brain the freedom to disconnect from all of that information, be at peace that there's going to be some, um, uh, you know, uh, action towards those items tomorrow. And you're able to leave those things more easily than allowing them to just keep running like rats on a wheel in your brain. And don't we all know how uncomfortable that can be when you have these thoughts that are just circling in your brain and you're like, oh, I can't, I can't forget to remember to do blank. I can't forget <laughs> right. to call this person. I can't, I, I got to respond to that email. I totally forgot, right? And it's, then five minutes later, like, what was I trying to remember? <laughs> yeah. 100%. It's just part of the human condition to like, sometimes I actually find that when I'm excited about something, you know, I'm like, I'm an ambitious guy. And when I get excited about an idea or, you know, excited about it, some type of interaction that I had with somebody, sometimes the thought processes become, they're exciting. And I'm like, oh, cool. Like, I can't wait to do this. I can't wait to do that. I can't wait to do that. And sometimes those exciting thought processes also keep me up when in reality, just like you said, if I just write down a piece of paper, be like, okay, cool. Let this get this out of my head, put it down yes. over here. Then I can go to sleep and then I can, I can refer to it in the future. This makes a huge difference. Yeah. And I'm speaking from experience. You know, I'm like you, Cyrus. I have lots of things that you know, are in my mind. And so I have learned from experience, I, if I write them down, I sleep well. If I don't write them down, it's churning. No doubt. Churning is the right word. Now, actually, as you were talking about these various aspects of sleep hygiene, it, I just had an epiphany. And the epiphany here is that the Mastering Diabetes Method, what we teach people how to do, 
involves four components. Number one, eating a whole food plant-based diet that's low in fat. Number two, uh, daily movement. Number three, intermittent fasting when necessary. And then number four is documentation of, you know, your blood glucose and your daily activities in a very systematic manner. Three of those four components are components that you just talked about that actually improve your sleep hygiene. And improving your sleep hygiene is one aspect in regulating your blood glucose and maintaining or increasing your level of insulin sensitivity. So it's almost this beautiful symphony. It's a very beautiful story that says, if you apply this lifestyle that is centered around a plant-based diet, that is centered around moving your body frequently, that is centered around time-restricted eating or, or controlling the times in which you're putting food into your body, those are three extremely powerful things that you can do that have a direct result on your blood glucose, but also have an indirect result on your blood glucose by positively affecting your sleep patterns. Yeah, that's brilliant. And I would add one more that when we have a good night's sleep, this research shows that our willpower is more powerful. And so the willpower to you know, eat a whole food plant-based diet, to exercise, to follow and record your data. Um, you know, all, it plays into all of those as well. So that, that sleep is really a critical component that empowers the rest of that lifestyle. No question. You know, I read no. a study that talked about it this way, Cyrus. They said that, you know, when we wake up, essentially being awake is accumulating a sleep debt that has to get paid back at night. And if we don't repay that sleep debt, we carry over additional sleep debt in the next day. And so it's a, it, it's a different way of thinking about sleep, but it, it really highlights the importance of the, you know, that regenerative um, and uh, reparative process of sleep at nighttime.